Hi, this is Melanie Conroy from the University of Memphis. Um, I work on French uh, academies and salons and other literary networks, mostly in 19th century France, and uh, information visualization, especially of networks. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, visualizing some of these smaller networks. My overall data set has around 7,000 French writers, um, around 3,000 of whom have important connections. Um, but many of the, the groups that they're members of might have five members or 30 members. Um, and so visualizing those um, networks of different sizes is, is a huge part of, of what I've been working on, and that will be the top of this um, lightning talk. Uh, so generally, I don't, I'm not going to go through too much of this, but the, the data um, is based on the data model of the Salons Project, which I'm the co-director of with um, Chloe Edmondson. Um, and so I'm looking at academies, French academies and European academies. Um, salons and other literary gatherings, mostly in Paris. And then knowledge networks, what we call knowledge networks, um, sort of broad um, uh, broad collections of um, interests such as letters or sciences, social networks, so whether someone's in the aristocracy or whether they're elite or a member of the court. Uh, and then I'm also looking at publication metrics, mostly from VIAF, um, gender, nationality, genre, and movement to get a sense of the literary characteristics of these movements. Um, so some of the visualizations that I use, uh, use a map and a timeline, uh, and these are from Palladio. Um, so here you have um, the uh, male-led um, salons and other literary networks, and the nodes are sized um, for the number of members. So the Brebon, for example, the restaurant um, has a large number of members, um, and then also um, uh, a timeline, and you can see the Brebon here, um, that lasted for a very long time. So it gives you sort of a, a quick sense of which um, networks were the largest and which were the smallest, um, which ones lasted the longest. Sometimes, unfortunately, I don't know exactly how long they lasted and we don't have an end date. Um, but it also gives you a sense of geographic proximity, um, which, uh, net, which uh, gatherings were close to one another. Uh, and so here's the female-led um, salons and other gatherings. Um, and one thing that you see here very quickly through the timeline is that there are actually these female-led salons throughout the 19th century. Um, and one argument that um, has been made previously is they're much more important near the beginning of the century. Um, and uh, we can see um, that that's not the case. Um, but they do tend to be somewhat um, um, somewhat fewer. And once again, we can see the sort of geographic proximity, which ones um, were closer to one another, which ones are larger and had more members. Um, another way to display this same data, um, the bee swarm plot or hierarchy. So these are from um, raw graphs, which I very much encourage everyone to go and try out. Um, so this bee swarm plot, um, the, the color is for the, the type of gathering. Um, so you can see the academies. Um, are in red, salons are in green, um, and they're all placed on a timeline. So you can see the Jeux Floreau uh, founded much earlier, um, Académie Française, um, well before the 19th century. Um, and then many of these smaller, more short-lived gatherings um, being founded later. Um, so again, you see this pattern of the salons occurring throughout the century and not just at the beginning. Um, another way to map the same data, a hierarchy. Um, so again, the the um, the circles are, uh, show the size of the gathering, the number of members, um, but then they're placed within these hierarchies. So you can see that female hosted um, uh, gatherings uh, tend to be salons in private homes or other small gatherings. Um, and then the male hosted um, gatherings um, are uh, much, much more various in terms of the kinds of places they're hosted and the types. And so you can see the dinners, um, one large type, um, are hosted in restaurants um, and also cafes as well as in um, private homes. And then the same sort of thing for this, this and that. Network graphs. Um, so these um, can be very um, helpful at showing the overall structure. Um, so here's an unweighted network graph that gives you a good sense of you know, who attended uh, which gathering and also you know, who attended only one gathering. So these sort of outliers are people who uh, attended usually only one or two gatherings. Um, and then the people who were really at the center um, attended many gatherings and you know, the, the gatherings that had many members in common. But because it's not weighted, you can't get a sense of who's an important writer um, or even which gatherings had lots of people. 
Um, so a weighted um, network, and here it's weighted for the number of books approximately, um, which is drawn from ISBNs um, on VIAF. Um, so it's also sort of a measure of the uh, potential influence of uh, these authors, the, the, the fact that they've been reprinted um, in the modern era. Um, so we have uh, in light, uh, this sort of light gray, you have the gatherings and then you have the authors in a dark gray. Um, and so the dark gray gives you a sense of uh, how many, how many um, books the author um, produced and how many have been printed since then. And then the size of the gathering is the number of ISBNs associated with that particular literary circle. So it gives you a, a sense of the weighting. Um, here we have just the most important um, French writers. Um, so uh, Proust, uh, Rimbaud, Stendhal, um, those that had the most ISBNs. Um, and by, by only representing those um, uh, writers with the most ISBNs, um, we can see that we focus on the major figures, Guy de Maupassant, Emile Zola, all of these uh, important and influential writers. And um, by using this notions of, of sets further, um, we can also filter those people out. So we can include someone like Proust, we can include someone like Hugo that have produced a very large number of books. Um, but we can also filter those people out, which makes um, some of the more minor writers more visible. Um, so uh, here is uh, uh, writers who were born between uh, 1800 and 1820, so it's roughly the romantic genre, um, who have fewer um, ISBNs. Um, so these aren't unheard of people. Jules Zana is quite a major figure, Le Comte de Lille, but they're, they're people who might be hidden um, when we put those um, super nodes of you know, Victor Hugo or Proust in the mix. Um, and we also see um, some important, Delphine de Girardin is an important salonniere, um, and then Sainte-Beuve is also somebody who is known to attend many salons. Um, so by reducing the influence of um, the people with the most books, we can see some of the structure you know, hiding behind um, those major figures. Um, so that was just a brief idea of um, how we can use sets and the overall um, weighting of authors, how many books they wrote, um, how many um, ISBNs there are currently existing for their works in order to make networks um, more visible and in order to look at not just the major writers, um, but also uh, look for some of those more minor writers who may have been more influential um, within those social networks at the time. Um, so I am at the University of Memphis, that's my email, and I very much would like to hear from anyone who is working on literary networks or, um, or VIAF um, about any future collaborations. Thank you.